Okay, so now I thought we'd just shift gears into things that are slightly less confronting um, and just kind of let the eight worldly concerns conversation brew and digest and maybe we'll come back to it. But just kind of like keep thinking about what are my healthy refuges and what are my unhealthy refuges. I think that's a good ongoing conversation to keep having for yourself, okay? Um, all of us, all the time, even if we're already Buddhist, right? So we talked about we're taking refuge in the three jewels, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, because they are reliable. Yeah, free from fear, skilled in freeing others from fear, unbiased compassion, impartial goodwill, all the good stuff. And we're taking refuge towards positive states of mind, like compassion and kindness and patience, because those very things protect us from suffering and protect us from causing harm. And we're taking refuge from or away from negative states of mind, like anger, like attachment, like the eight worldly concerns. Because fear and faith that we talked about yesterday, remembering that those are technical terms in Buddhist thought referring to healthy fear and what your untamed mind can create, and faith based in experience and logic that the three jewels offer tools to save oneself from suffering. So we need a healthy refuge because left to its own devices, our mind is a bit of a troublemaker. <laughs> so we, you know, we wanna not have negative states of mind because they lead to destructive actions of body and speech harming others as well as oneself in the future. And it creates karmic seeds which ripen as future suffering and leads to repetitive habits and dissatisfaction. So, you know, we're just reinforcing what we already know. And then refuge towards, right, the obvious beneficial actions of body, speech, and mind, assisting or soothing others, right, creates positive karmic seeds which ripen as future happiness leads to repetitive habits and satisfaction and contentment, can be fully developed into complete Buddhahood enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings. And positive states of mind are what actually protects you from suffering and the causes of suffering. All right, so that's just kind of a summary of what we've talked about so far. Um, now we're gonna look at like refuge ceremony vows, just kind of shifting gears. So if you do want to take refuge from a qualified Lama, you can opt in to a number of different options. So refuge ceremony vows are to support our practice of ethics of non-harmfulness. And they're to create continuous merit, even while sleeping, by making our ethics committed and intentional. So when you take refuge, you're taking refuge in the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, then optional is to take vows. So you can take any of these vows, or all of these vows, or any combination of these vows at the same time that you take refuge. And, you know, some people take refuge a few different times and add more vows each time. Um, I think that it's it's useful to take as many as you feel up to. Um, they are the classics, right? Not to kill, not to steal, not to lie, not to engage in sexual misconduct and not to take intoxicants. So we'll go into kind of some specifics of those, but just procedurally, what you're doing at the refuge ceremony is usually reciting what the Lama recited back making promises, right? So they say, I take refuge in the Buddha Dharma Sangha. And you say, I take refuge in the Buddha Dharma Sangha. So it might be English, it might be Tibetan, but you're promising that yes, I am having my core spiritual practice, Buddhist practice. I can still use other things, but my main heart practice is going to be Buddhist from this point onward. So that's universal. But then if you want to take refuge vows, there's a point at which the teacher will say, and now, you know, we're going to take refuge vows, or they just run along in Tibetan, depending on the teacher. So you want to know before you get to the ceremony, which vows you want to take. Because some teachers explicitly say, now we're doing no killing. And you think, yep, taking the vow not to kill. Ding! 
some of them just race along in Tibetan and you're just struggling to keep up. So what you want, the main thing is that in your mind, you think before all of the Buddhas, I'm promising these vows. And you say in your head, which ones you're taking. That's the main thing. Say in your head, which ones you're taking. So any combination, that makes sense. Um, a lot of you already have refuge or a few of you are thinking about taking refuge as a mixture. Young Zee Rinpoche is gonna be offering refuge soon. Um, Geshe Sherab in Santa Fe is gonna be offering refuge soon. So, you know, maybe some of your teachers will be doing that. Um, if you've slipped a bit in your refuge vows, you can retake refuge and that's a nice thing to do. Every time we take Bodhisattva vows with His Holiness the Dalai Lama, um, unless you're a monastic, you're reviving your, um, your refuge vows. Monastics don't because we have higher vows, so we don't, you know, downgrade them. My question is, since I took um, my vows in the Zen tradition, mm. um, I was wondering, um, would I have to, if I chose, and I'm considering it, doing with Tibetan as well, um, would I have to take it in the Tibetan tradition as well? Well, the vows are the vows. They're not um, tradition specific, right? Okay. Um, yeah. Zen vows are the same as, as the Tibetan vows. It's more about, do you want to make a relationship with that teacher that's giving the vows? Or do you want to upgrade if you don't have all five of them yet or something like that? Okay. So, so Vinaya is universal, right? A lot of the other teachings, you know, some, some schools of thought focus more on one, some focus more on the other. But remember that Buddhism is not like Christianity. Um, you know, Christians have, you know, all sorts of different kinds of Protestants and all sorts of different kinds of Catholics. Yeah. And often it's like a difference of opinion that uh -huh. is creating the different schools. In Buddhism, it's not about differing opinions so much as emphasizing specific teachings that suit those students, right? So it could be that your like main practice is Zen, but then you like some of the Tibetan emphasized teachings as well, so you cross fertilize. Um, I think it's useful to have a home tradition just for efficiency, because you know the different traditions will sometimes use terminology differently. And so you can get mixed up and think, oh, is clear light mind the same as ground luminosity, the same as fundamental consciousness? And you can get all kind of tangled because they use terminology differently. Um, so it's useful to have like a heart tradition for that reason. But there's no problem in being a hybrid. <laughs> yeah. No, there's no problem in cherry picking every now and again. No, no. Um, you know, if you're if you have a root guru and they say, oi. So you settle down, <laughs> that's <laughs> a good knowing, right? But if you're thinking um, in terms of your sitting practice, like you want to do, you know, 20 minutes of Zazen, and then you want to do a tantric sadhana that your teacher empowered, and then you want to do some analytical Lam Rim. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. It's all to the good. Yeah, they're all tools. Use what works. So yeah, don't feel like you're being like disloyal or some sort of weirdness. Like it, it's all from the Buddha. It's all from the Buddha. So use what works. Um, yes, um, Venerable, I have um, a question about one and five. Can I just one go ahead and do yeah, so, yeah, hit me. Um, the not kill one. Um, I am assuming that um, you know, if I am not a total vegetarian, that I am part of a stream. I may not directly be killing animals, but animals are killed on my behalf if I'm still eating any meat. So I'm assuming that I cannot take um, not kill that, that one. However, I've heard um, that there's a difference of opinion on that and that the real intent is not to kill people. So what, um, tell me what, which one is. <laughs> Well, it becomes a difference between uh, a transgression and to break a vow at the root, right? So there's like a million ways you can transgress a vow, but you still have the vow and you can still purify the vow. To break it at the root, you have to kill a human being on purpose, right? So to lose the vow, to no longer have the vow would be if you killed a human being on purpose to transgress the vow, there's a lot of ways we could transgress the vow. Any act of intentional killing transgresses the vow. There's a really good argument about 
what is it to eat meat? Because you're not directly killing. But yes, the meat has been killed on your behalf, but it hasn't been killed for you as an individual, specifically Vicky. But like, say if your best friend went fishing and killed a fish for you specifically thinking this fish is for Vicky, that would be a big transgression. But if you went to the store and bought a fish, the same size, shape, color, it's less of a transgression because it wasn't specifically for you, Vicky. So what we're looking at is that in samsara, there is no way to avoid harming sentient beings, which is one of the ways that we have fuel to get out of samsara, right? Like animals were killed in the creation and transportation of our clothes. We kill insects every time we drive, right? We might've you know, run over something when we were driving. Um, pretty much everything we consume involves harm, even harm to human beings, right? So the only way to avoid harming sentient beings is to get out of samsara. That's the only real way. So in terms of the no killing vow, you can actually keep eating meat and have the no killing vow, but you wanna do it with eyes wide open knowing it's a problematic industry and animals are harmed. And you, know, you just wanna do it eyes wide open, not lying to yourself. And so you just kind of gradually, and it, you know, and if you can work up to not eating meat because it's a problematic industry and it harms animals, excellent. But you don't want to be kind of like, if you're a fallen fruit vegan Jane aesthetic, you don't want to think that you're somehow morally superior because you still have to walk from here to there and you're still stepping on things and harming things, right? So for Buddhists, we're trying to aspire for the Bodhisattva path, which is the greatest good. And if you need to have a strong, healthy body in order to study and practice deeply and then circle back and benefit those same animals you once ate, that's the mentality to have. And to see the meat as medicine, not to eat it for the flavor, not to eat it out of attachment, but to see it as medicine and a problematic medicine that you would like to have a rebirth that no longer needed that. These are the kind of thoughts to have. So if, for example, you've been eating meat at every meal or every day, you might wanna consider how can I cut back to the amount that my body actually needs, which is maybe once every two weeks or once a month, or maybe not at all if I get more clever about my cooking. You know what I mean? So you're like just gently, gently weaning yourself off of habits that are problematic in all forms. But really, you know, consumption of all forms is something that we want to be looking at really honestly, like buy less clothes, you know, <laughs> use less stuff, right? Just generally look at consumption. So, um, you know, meat's a complicated conversation and there's a lot to discuss around health, around poverty, around, you know, socioeconomic stuff. And so it's kind of like, use your own self-knowledge of when are you making a justification and when are you making a choice that sustains your practice and you're really the only one that knows that does that does that help so you can still take the no killing back thank you that helps helps a lot i wanted to see what the take was on that and then the other one is the fifth vow not taking intoxicants i've heard a little little bit of mixed messaging on this one that from all the way like absolutely no alcoholic consumption at all all the way to Dalai Lama who said well, just try not to get drunk a little teeny weeny bit of is okay you know so <laughs> what's the what's that, that the one message? depends on the teacher giving you the refuge vow the, the other four are non-negotiable, like what, what is it to transgress and what is it to break from the root is pretty universally agreed upon, but the intoxicant vow, it's actually a branch, it's not a root vow, and for that reason, there's a little bit more of um, the teacher will say, if you take the no intoxicant vow, for me, that means absolute straight edge, cold turkey, don't touch anything. For some teachers, it'll be don't drink two intoxication such that you couldn't drive, for example, you know, some will be more specific. Um, and so, you know, I don't know about Young Zee Rinpoche. Do you know, Lee, what does he say about the no intoxicant vow when he offers it? Uh, it's complicated. <laughs> it depends on the crowd, I suppose, probably too. I mean, I, I don't, he doesn't hold that absolutely not a drop. 
yeah. perspective, um, generally speaking, with students. But I think he's a little bit more. It, he doesn't offer the precepts very often. If at all, I maybe privately with people as they ask, and then maybe just depends on the relationship and the what's going to be best for that student is my sense. Yeah, but, but I can't speak for him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I don't know. If, so some of the teachers have a real consistent thing that they always do, and some of them actually really base it on the group or the particular student. So I think it's just important for your own thinking to, if you're not kind of there yet, don't take the vow. It, it's better to to not take it. Yeah. The other vows, if you think, oh, I can't be perfect, so I shouldn't take it. That's the wrong thinking, right? Because you can transgress them very easily, but to break them at the root actually takes a lot. And so you can purify and kind of get back in the saddle. If you have the no killing vow and you're cleaning your kitchen, if you see a little ant, you can't wipe over the top of it. No, you can't. But you might sit down and purify it and stop it. You know what I mean? Like you might bug bomb your house. You shouldn't. Don't do that. But if you did, do a medicine Buddha puja, do, you know, do a purification practice, move on, get back in the saddle. You know, it's, it's better to have the trend of I am intentionally not killing. I'm intentionally not killing. Because when you take the vow, you're creating this amazing mental momentum every second of every day that you hold that vow, even when you're not aware of it. Whereas before you took the vow, you were only creating like saving life karma when you were intentionally saving life. You were only creating refraining from killing karma when you had the opportunity to kill and you decided not to. When you have the vow, it's just this amazing wave of merit all the time because you're saying all the time on purpose, I will not harm. And then occasionally you make a mistake then you just pick yourself back up. Um, so that's a, it's, it's an interesting one to explore for yourself. Really, the intoxicant vow is the least important because intoxication and intoxicants are not natural misdeeds. They're misdeeds by prohibition because under their influence, you might break all the other ones, right? You might, you know, so if you're drunk, you might kill something, you might lie, you might sleep with someone's partner, you know, like, right? Whereas if you weren't drunk, you might keep your act together. That's why it's on the list is that because if you're intoxicated, you're less clear, but it's not naturally a misdeed. Thank so, you. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, Denise, you have one? Yes, thank you. Very quickly. Um, I've actually been eating less meat and I've always taken spiders outside. Uh, but as a gardener, when, I, uh, when my plants are invaded by squash bugs, I'm out to kill them. <laughs> I mean, I'm, right. I'm picking them off and putting them in a, in a bowl of water with soap. And, and so I intentionally am killing these squash bugs that are harming my, my plants. So I, I, there's no reconciliation in that. You know, spiders, no big deal. I bring, I bring them outside and say, here's a flower. You'll yeah. have a lot more to eat there, you know. But um, so I'm, I'm not sure about that because it, it is an intention that I want to and you know off. that you're, you're you know that you're going to keep doing it after the vow maybe wait on it but just something okay. to explore I mean when I when I visit Taiwan um, the nunnery there has a, a community garden for the nunnery yes. and what they do is they split it in half and they have the insect garden and the human garden and they pick off the insects of the human garden and then they transfer them to the insect garden. You know, so then the insects can just like decimate this whole half. And of course, like there's not like a hard barrier, like they'll find their way over, you know, it's not a perfect solution, but um, there's a lot of care put into transportation of them somewhere where they can keep having their lifespan, but not eat the human food. And of course, creative permaculture and all sorts of creative solutions. So, you know, it's worth experimenting if there's ways you can be a more compassionate yeah. gardener. But maybe I'll just briefly run through transgression as opposed to breaking at the root, just so you're all kind of on the same page. So, as we said, not to kill is to refrain from intentionally destroying any sentient life and to break from the root one must intentionally kill a human being or a potential human being. Um, so that includes fetuses. Um, so again, you know, remembering that in Buddhism, we don't want to kill anything. So that includes fetuses. That means you can't have an abortion if you have this vow. 
it also means it's personal and we're not going to be in everybody else's business right we're not going to like be judging people who make that choice we're not going to be in you know encouraging legislation that is attacking women's sovereignty right but for a personal thing if you have that vow you're promising not to have an abortion even if you have an unwanted pregnancy so it's an important piece to know but it's personal it's not political politically we still you know are going to be good progressive people that don't want a slippery slope right um, and that's my own opinion about the distinction some llamas would think differently but for the most part we're not really on board with um laws that are going to oppress individual freedom that doesn't harm other people but then the question is what is the right of the potential person in the womb and there's a lot of debate around that and a lot of heated debate around that and it's a conversation worth having with yourself but really the main point here is if you have that vow you can't have an abortion or you break it from the root and that's an incredibly heavy karma because it's already a heavy karma to kill a human being or a potential human being but now you're also breaking the vow um, if you have any of that in your past it's purifiable right so if you've made that choice in your past you know we're all humans we have complicated lives do some good vajrasattva do some 35 buddhas rescue some animals destined for slaughter do some acts of saving life and don't let it weigh on you and make you have a heavy heart you can purify anything yeah is everybody how's everybody feeling with that i know it's a little bit of a sensitive subject but choices yeah um the the stealing one's probably the easiest one to keep for us except when we think about some of you our um internet habits Right, so we're to refrain from intentionally taking anything belonging to another that hasn't been freely offered. So if we're downloading a movie and we're not paying for it, you know, that's stealing, right? Um, to break it at the root, one must intentionally take something with enough value to be prosecuted by the laws of the land. So, um, that's that's the question so there's some wiggle room country to country but what we're saying is that um, any act of taking what hasn't been freely offered is a transgression but to break it at the root at the root you know um, it's something that would make you go to jail or be prosecuted in some way so that no stealing one does that make sense to everybody do you have questions about that it's kind of the easiest one so like don't steal pens from work but it's not gonna break the vow at the root right but you know still don't take pens from work <laughs> unless you're allowed to i was wondering um um taking things from the internet for example um like from tushita and they have course material and download it to the drive is, that's if okay? it's really offered it's fine yeah, yeah if it's really offered oh. and usually i'm guessing if it's on the Toshida website it's freely offered right yeah okay. so don't worry about that and um other articles you know like from study buddhism and things like that we can yeah. download those yeah they're all freely offered those are freely oh. offered it's more like okay. i don't know um what's a good example it's like if you were watching a dharma talk on someone's uh private channel and they were monetizing it and then you downloaded it and didn't pay for it and then you shared it and they didn't pay for it you know that becomes oh, quite a yeah. problematic thing probably um, beyond me but i understand yeah you know or if you're like yeah. photocopying more than the publisher's allowed amount of a book yeah. you know so like mm -hmm. you know you might want to share a page of a book and that's you know within some sort of fair use copyright agreement and you want probably fine but if it's you know like chapters and chapters of a book that's more than what the publisher yeah. is allowed. Mm. And so that would be feeling. Yeah. 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 And mm. yeah, as Lee's weighing and saying it never hurts to give credit and cite your sources if you reuse them, even if they're yeah. freely given. I a hundred percent agree. So like if you download study Buddhism, put the study but Buddhism website at the bottom, stuff like that. Yeah. Mm, yes. Thank you. Thank you. So it, it's usually kind of obvious if if it's stealing because there's like a few more steps <laughs> to make it get into your computer or something. Mm. Yeah. Um, Can I ask another question? Sure. Yeah. Um, it goes back to killing. Mm. Um, you know, I have a dog and I have mm. bathed him because he gets fleas. Mm. So, 
you know, what do I do? Or yep. put, or there's a medicine that you can do, you can put on the dog that prevents fleas. Well, that's yeah, my well, no, it's a good question to throw back at you because these are the conversations we have to have with ourselves, right? Do you think yeah. it's better to prevent or to kill? Yeah, right? yeah. Yeah, prevention is going to always be better, right? Prevention doesn't yeah. necessarily kill anything. Like I put on bug spray if I'm going in the woods. I'm not wanting to kill anything. I just don't want them to suck my blood and give me Lyme disease, right? Yeah. Because um, mm -hmm. they'll be less effective to sentient beings if I have Lyme disease. Yes. Right. But, I, but if there's a yeah. tick on me, I'm going to very, very gently try to remove it. I don't want to hurt it, you know, even if it's like pumping stuff in. You know, I'm going to do my best, right, to not hurt it if I'm taking it off. Mm -hmm. So all of these choices, again, you do your very best with the least amount of harm. And then if you transgress, you just definitely purify. You're not like pretending that it's not harmful when it is. Mm. Yeah, you're saying that was harmful. That was not ideal. That's not what I'd like to keep doing. I need to purify and do better next time. And don't make it a huge whole mental drama. Just that was an ideal. I need to do better. Okay. Yeah, try not to identify too much with your, your mistakes, yeah. So even um, bathing, bathing, you know, putting them in the bath, if there are fleas that are killed. Yeah, do, do your best not to. And if you mm -hmm. notice that you have, blow some medicine Buddha mantras okay. on any fleas mm -hmm. that you see and make sure you purify on those days really sincerely. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in the future, you're doing more preventative measures and less killing measures. Yep. Mm, I, I believe you. putting garlic. I believe putting garlic in your dog's food, a little bit of it, uh, kind of <laughs> through their pores, a little bit, and that repels the fleas. They migrate quickly. <clears throat> you don't need to put so much in that they stink of garlic. Put a bit. <laughs> yeah. Look, I, you know, I know, and it's it's another way for us to remember how hard it is to not harm sentient things in samsara and to reinforce your renunciation mm, yeah. thank you so i mean it's it's a dance isn't it because you don't want to over justify but you also don't want to be illogical <clears throat> mm. got to live our life and we want the greatest good and these are really personal assessments but acts that are intentional have a lot more power than acts that are not intentional mm. yeah Mm, thank and you. acts that you've promised to refrain from then have even that much more power, both positive and negative. Um, there is a question in the chat box um, posted by Tulsi. Mm. She asks, what about death with dignity? Meaning, so we're still on the death with dignity. Meaning euthanasia, I assume? Yes. If you're a Buddhist and you've taken the no killing vow, do not kill yourself. It's not a complete karma in the same way that murder is. So that's what's tricky is, you know, if you look at the karma section of the Lam Rim, you need branches complete for a complete karma. And the final branch is the act has been done and you're rejoicing in having done it. If you kill yourself in whatever form, you're not able to do that final act of rejoicing because you've already popped into another life or the Bardo experience. So it's less heavy than murder but it's still really pushing it in terms of, of vow breakage. I think the reason that a lot of us might consider euthanasia is yes, dignity, pain, these sorts of things. Um, if we understand cause and effect and past and future lives, ending your suffering in this moment does not prevent it in the future. And so in your next life, the suffering will continue. So you haven't done anything to finish it except just kind of interrupt it for a moment. And now it's in a new form, but now you also have a heavy karma on your mental continuum. Now, of course, we wanna respect people's choices and respect other people's decisions with their own bodies. But when we have a vow like that, it's, it's an important consideration to sit with. Pain relief is not a problem. Right, so if you're at end of life and you need some morphine or you need pain relief things, that's not transgressing the vow, that's fine. And so if you need a lot of pain relief support, it's just, you know, there's that tricky moment of truth of when is morphine pain relief and when is it tipping over into ending your life? And when is that intentional or when is that incidental? 
And it's quite a gray area. And those of you that have been nurses or in palliative care know it's a very gray area of when does morphine use turn into something that is actually intentionally wanting to end the life? And when is it just a side effect of soothing pain? And a lot of it boils down to the intention of the person taking it and the intention of the person giving it. So these are, these are delicate things and we wanna be really sensitive to people needing pain relief at the time of death because dying with a peaceful mind is really important. But ending the life of a human being is always going to be a heavy karma. It'll be a less heavy karma when it's done with compassion, 100%. Just like killing animals is always negative, but if you're doing it out of compassion, it's slightly less negative than if you're doing it out of anger or carelessness or something like that, right? So your reasons do matter. Your reasons do matter karmically. If you do something with an affliction, of course, it's much heavier than if you do something with ignorance and compassion, and they're kind of taking turns going back and forth. You know, it's not like every act is the same just because the action is the same, the reasons matter. But it's an important consideration for us as Buddhists, you know, killing is a really big deal. Yeah, Teresa. So with a family member, we promised each other, mm. you know, if you're in this state, yeah. then I will unplug you. Or right. But now I'm thinking, well, for one thing, I need to consider that. But also, if that person is saying, I will do that for you, then I'm asking them to take on the negative karma. Well, and there's a difference between pulling the plug and injecting, right? So if, if pulling the plug means that your karma finishes at a natural rate and no additional measures are taken to prematurely end the life, you're just removing the things that were sustaining kind of falsely sustaining a life that is a different karma mm -hmm. than like giving more morphine so that uh, someone actively dies. Okay. So that gray area, it's, it's a lot less close to killing if you're just taking someone off life support. Yeah, that's a different thing, taking someone off life support than intentionally giving them something that ends the life. But you're a hundred percent right that whatever you're asking people to do, you're sharing in the karma of that. They are sharing in the karma of that. If they do it on your behalf, you're both getting that karma, both positive or negative, depending on what the action is. Yeah, there, there are important things to sit with, especially if there's power of attorney and spouse stuff to look at of what is fair to ask of one another and what is karmically sound to ask of one another. These are important questions. Um, yeah. Yeah, Eleanor. I'm just wondering about putting on our advanced care plan, do not resuscitate. Yeah, yeah. And that's fine, right? Because you're not saying kill me. <laughs> you're saying no. don't keep, <laughs> keep, uh, keep <laughs> agitating my heart organ. <laughs> right? <laughs> Yeah, so that, that's, yeah, and for sure, do not resuscitate things are fine, especially because sometimes if you can um, die naturally, you can die with a peaceful mind. Mm. If you keep being resuscitated, it can be kind of agitating. Yeah, mm. so that's mm. fine. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and then Christine was asking about if I refuse food when almost at end of life. That's a, that's a tricky one. That, refusing food because you know it will and the life, that is a really delicate one. I, I think that it's gonna be a lot about the intention. If you're just not able to eat, it's a different thing than I will stop eating right now because I want to die. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're two different, you know, so it's, I think it's gonna boil down to the intention. Yeah, if I physically cannot eat and I know that's going to lead to dying sooner, that's a different thing than I will not eat because I want to die now. And that's what we want to avoid. Yeah. Remember that pain is exhausting old negative karma. It's finishing old negative karma. And if you can bring a positive mindset to the suffering experience, you can think, here's some baggage I'm not taking with me. You know, I'm about to change bodies, like changing clothes. Yeah, and this, this one is really running out of gas and it's really causing me a lot of grief, but that's some grief I don't have to take with me is one way to look at it, yeah.
Yeah. But yeah, just be so gentle with yourself and so gentle with each other when having this conversation because we've got all sorts of different relationships with physical pain. We've got all sorts of different relationships with how we see our body and its dignity. If you're not attached to the body as being the self, pooing and peeing in front of people and drooling is not as traumatic as if you very much identify with your body as being the self, then you feel humiliated by those same bodily activities. You know, and everybody's relationship with their body is different. And so we wanna just be so gentle with people. Yeah, when they're making these choices and personally do our best to not identify with the body so much so that it's easier for us to just let it play out. Yeah, how does that sit with you guys? I know it's, it's a hard conversation to have, but important. Yeah. It's an interesting thought. I just want to say that when um, loved ones maybe pass away in a violent or in a violent or painful way mm. to think to bring the thought how fortunate that they didn't have to take yeah so that's really interesting and that they finish that particular karmic seed too they're done with that one is also good to think too yeah, it's done it's done but you know th there's so many different variations of this conversation aren't there and you know just for example i was at my folks house and they made the choice to put down one of their horses i was not involved in the choice i would have made a different choice but since they were making that choice i was happy i was there because then i could do some prayers for the horse and i could give them money pills and i could you know bonk them with a stupa and do all of the end of life things to try and help the horses transition into their next life even though I would not have put it down myself. But that horse was not in my care. It was not in my responsibility. And, you know, if I had resources to look after it its whole life, I would have loved to have done so, but it wasn't my choice to make. But I can somehow make their choice softened a little bit. And maybe, you know, and I tried to talk to them in such a way that they were most coming from compassion when it happened and hopefully had some regret as well so that their karma was less heavy for having taken the life of this being. But of course they love the horse so much. They genuinely wanted to put her out of her suffering. And if they don't believe in future lives, it's not like I can inject them with that knowledge, right? So you just kind of do your best. Yeah. So we'll just finish the last couple because they're pretty straightforward and then we'll have a break for lunch and um, if you have any questions kind of come up in the, in the lunch break, make sure to um, remember them. So not to lie is so straightforward, right? It's just refrain from intentionally deceiving another. That's to transgress it. But to break at the root, one must intentionally lie about a spiritual realization. So if you say that you've realized something and you haven't, that is so damaging because what if people believe you and follow you and you start a cult and you create all sorts of harm? If people believe that kind of lie, it's devastating harm. You know, if someone, you know, if someone says to you, do I look fat in these jeans? And you say, no, no, you know, those kind of white lies for the sake of others, they're not ideal, but there's a time and a place and you can purify them, right? When you're genuinely, you know, it's, it's pretty benign but anything to do with your spiritual realizations or lack thereof you, we want to be so cautious because people are so vulnerable and they want to believe in something and they want to follow someone and if you're kind of making out to be some sort of grand practitioner they're going to listen to your nonsense and believe it to be wisdom and that's you know so dangerous right and, and that's why the lamas, if you say, you know, have you realized emptiness? They'll always say, uh, no, 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 or we don't talk about that because it's so damaging to go the other way. We have to model, we're not talking about that because you cannot check it. If you can't check it, that's not fair, you know, to put yourself out there as some sort of magical being. Yeah. So, you know, sometimes the, you'll, you can be disappointed and think, oh, I thought you would have realized emptiness by now. And they're saying, no, no, no. They're almost lying to overcompensate for making sure that they don't make a fault of lying about realizations or create a culture where it's okay to do so. Yeah. 
So basically don't ask people about their realizations <laughs> and don't tell people about yours. Um, and when in doubt, err on the side of, I know nothing, I've realized nothing. So far, so good. I like the Dharma. That's it, <laughs> right? Just safety first. We don't want any cults, right? Yeah, do your best. Remember your motivation. Um, and then we have no sexual misconduct, you know, refrain from harming through sexual activity, basically. And to break at the root, one commits a penetrative sexual act with someone else's recognized partner, or you cheat on your own partner. Yeah, so that's basically good old fashioned adultery. Um, you know, there's all sorts of, I don't know, polyamorous folks in the Dharma community. If everyone's on board and it's all transparent, that's not adultery, is it? Like healthy consensual adult relationships are none of our business, whatever. If there's a recognized commitment and you are breaking a commitment or helping someone else break theirs, it breaks apart families. And that kind of disruption is really damaging. And every time you break a promise, it makes, easy, it, makes it easier to break a promise. So if you've made a promise to someone else and you're saying to hell with it, your own promises start to lose some power and it's hard to kind of patch that up again. So everything can be purified, but don't cheat on each other, <laughs> right? And don't steal other people's partners. The usual question is why aren't truly horrible sexual acts listed in this? And there's a few different uh, opinions on that. One opinion is things like um, assault and rape and child abuse are so out of the norm of healthy adult behavior. They're not even on the list because they're so bad. You know, it's like it goes without saying. So that's one reason I've heard the Lama say why the really heinous acts aren't talked about in terms of breaking it from the root. More conservative teachers will say those heinous acts harm one person, adultery harms a whole family. And then you can debate with them and say, it doesn't just harm one person and they'll usually give in if you debate with them. But you know, if you hear one of the old fashioned Geshis say that, speak up <laughs> for the cause, right? And usually because they love to debate, they will cede to your superior logic, right? So, but th so those are the reasons I usually hear for why the really heinous acts aren't listed. It's more like, what are things that you as a regular, generally good hearted person might get up to? You might get up to having harmful behaviors with your sexuality. Don't, <laughs> yeah, I promise not to. And it creates the cause for harmonious communities and harmonious relationships now and in the future. So it's, it's a nice vow to have. Um, so do with that information what you will. In the Lumrim, there's um, a lot of kind of specific, odd sexual prohibitions, you know, like don't have sex during the day. And what that means is if you live communally, someone will walk in on you and embarrassed. Prevent that, you know, so it's contextual or it's related to hygiene, you know, so those kind of miscellaneous ancient prohibitions, you always have to remember the audience in the context. Um, and a lot of the specific kind of like micromanaging of sexual behavior didn't actually come from the Buddha. It was add-ons like in the third and fourth century from various Indian scholars who were responding to like the popularity of the Karma Sutra and things like that and trying to get people to not get carried away. So a lot of those additional miscellaneous prohibitions are actually add-ons um, and weren't from the Buddha himself. So fun facts. Summary is don't hurt each other. And, um, and then no intoxicants we talked about. Refraining from substances that disturb mental clarity and judgment and to break them one intentionally takes the substance with the intention to be intoxicated by it. It doesn't say break from the root because it's not a root vow. It's a, it's a, you know, something that's by prohibition. And so it's good to think about, but it's a branch. So those are the five. You can opt in or opt out um, at your refuge ceremony. Sometimes the teacher will say, we're only giving refuge, we're not doing vows, and they're just giving the refuge, which is incredibly powerful and beautiful in and of itself. So um, depends on the teacher. But when His Holiness gives Bodhisattva vows online live, he often also gives refuge at the same time, 
often with the option to take the vows. So if you're wanting to do that and your own teacher hasn't been offering the vows, often his holiness will do it when he's doing live classes, particularly if it's a very obviously Buddhist topic, not something that's like secular for scientists or something. When it's a Buddhist topic, often his holiness um, also does refuge. Yeah, Teresa. Good question. If they're separating out, as they often do, refuge and refuge vows, vows, yeah. Are these what you're going over right now? Are these bodhisattvas? These aren't bodhisattvas. No. These are refuge vows. These are refuge vows. Okay. Uh, they're vows of approaching virtue. I believe they're called Genyan vows in Tibetan. And they are the foundation that you it's good to have mm -hmm. before you take bodhisattva vows. Ah. You need bodhisattva vows before you take tantric vows. So they're kind of layered in that way. Exactly. So, so okay. taking care of yourself isn't directly related to the vows, but it's 100% fantastic and proceed. <laughs> okay. But, but yeah, the vows okay. themselves are just related to training and non-harmfulness. Okay. All right. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Venerable. Yeah. And usually when people take bodhisattva vows, the teacher will also give refuge vows to kind of revive them right in the beginning. So you'll revive your refuge. Sometimes they'll revive your refuge and your refuge vows. And then you'll take bodhisattva vows. And the understanding is that, you know, you start with refraining from harm and then you layer on top of that, this altruistic intention that's really examining deeper ways of refraining from harm as well as being of benefit. So, you know, the lay vows are very much about obvious tangible activities, mm -hmm. you know, where sure. bodhisattva vows become much more internal. Like for example, the first bodhisattva vow is uh, to refrain from praising oneself and belittling others. Okay. So you're the one that knows internally if that's what your speech is up to. You know, I sometimes see. other people can tell, and sometimes it's kind of subtle, you know, sure. so it's a little bit more um, personally what you know to be true as opposed to what kind of objectively people could gauge. Okay. And okay, tantric so vows are even more subtle than that and even more specific than that. So they, they go in layers of training. That's very interesting. Okay, thank, thank you. So there is some... Um instruction provided in the bodhisattva vows of how to be a benefit it's not just kind of left yeah wide yeah. open it gets all yeah. sorts of specific yes 18 root okay. vows and 48 secondary offenses and don't you worry we got lists. wow <laughs> <laughs> yes yes we got okay lists. And Thank the you. nice thing about the bodhisattva vows is that you can study them before you take them, right? So the vows you can study before you take them are the refuge vows and the bodhisattva vows. You can't study mm -hmm. the tantric vows and the monastic vows before you take them, theoretically. Okay. And the reason for that is, is just kind of a psychological exercise of if you know them without commentary, they don't make a lot of sense and they're too intimidating. And so during the time of the the vow taking, you'll generate doubt and think, oh, I don't know uh, if I can keep that. So then that right. stops it from settling into your continuum solidly. So it's better you don't know, take them on and then learn about them. And then you're like, oh no, but you already have them. So if you make transgressions, you can repair them. And again, it's hard to break them at the root, you know? Mm -hmm. I can see that. Like that. So, so I very much recommend you study the Bodhisattva vows um, because they're, oh. they're inspiring, but also you're allowed to. So then you kind of have a sense of them going in. Uh, my question is actually about the earlier meditation. Is it all right if I ask about that? Yeah, yeah. The eight about the eight, yeah, the eight worldly dharmas. So um, when you asked us to think about the morning and how we wake up and how we go through the morning, I I knew this already, but it it was made me more aware of how I just go from next, next, next attachment, hold on, keep on living. <laughs> and, and my morning is justifiably busy. You know, I have kids and I have to get them to school and I have to walk the dogs and do my practice and get to work like many of us. But it's, it's um, what I'm realizing is some of the frustrations with my practice is that it has to fit into that mm -hmm. attachment after attachment and this sort of yearning to live of next. And I, I wondered if you could in context maybe of the eight worldly dharmas or or maybe otherwise help me understand that a little bit better well for me it's very useful to come back to what is an affliction you know what is a disturbing emotion 
And kind of the quickest definition is that which disturbs the mind. So when your mind is agitated, it's on the verge of danger. Yeah, it's on the verge of danger. And when you kind of feel that agitation of mind, whether it's just kind of amorphous anxiety, you know, and you, it's not even turned into irritation, it's not even turned into neediness, it's just kind of amorphous anxiety, unsettledness, it's already, you know, starting to get some momentum. And so if you can say to yourself, what do I need to say to myself to not have push and pull, to not chase and retreat? How do I not chase and retreat, chase and retreat, you know, or like pull, 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 push, push, push. How can I stop that tug of war internally? Because that is the essence of the eight worldly concerns is push and pull hopes and fears. Yeah. And if you can kind of like, and that's why there's so much emphasis on let's be present. You know, there's nothing that significant about the present per se, but it can help ground you away from push and pull. You know, and so, okay, <sighs> what is my practice really? Is my practice being a good girl and sitting on my good girl cushion with my good girl water bowls and like ticking all the boxes? Or is it being kind to my family? You know, like what is my practice really? And what are the things that like support that practice genuinely? Going through the motions of what a practice should look like is not a practice. Even if you have the most beautiful altar set out in the most traditional way, perfectly dusted with all ethically obtained offerings and all of the things, if you're grumpy about it, what's the point? For me in the morning, my first practice is done while I'm still in bed. I haven't even gotten up yet. I'm just thinking the purpose of my life is to free all sentient beings from suffering and bring them to enlightenment. Therefore, I must become enlightened for all sentient beings, for all sentient beings. And I just talk to myself about bodhicitta in bed, all cozy, under the blankies, until it's real again, or until it's vivid again. You know, I believe it the first time I say it, but it takes a while for it to warm up, <laughs> you know? And, so, and sometimes I'll repeat the short bodhisattva vows prayer, or I'll recite the refuge in bodhicitta prayer, just quietly in my head. And then I do my, you know, washing, brushing, you know, brushing teeth, whatever things. And then I come and sit, but I'm not telling myself you need to jolt awake and jolt into practice and jolt into this. You know, I'm just being sensible about it so that it's as true as it possibly can be at my level. And so that's the discipline in the morning is make your motivation as true as it can be. And if that's just a quiet conversation you have in your head while you're gently gathering your clothes, gently having a shower, gently, 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 before you have to have too many interactions with humans, that's, a, that's very sensible. You know, if it means getting up a little earlier and doing a sit sitting practice, that's fantastic, but don't like force it like it's a chore. You know, it, it's got to be things that genuinely launch you well in a day. So it could be once the kids are off and launched, then you have five minutes to just sit and even just do five minutes of shamatha after the chaos of the children, <laughs> right? Or, you know, or you have some just very quiet mantras you do while you're walking the dog because your practice is your own it's your own mind so it's it's really asking what seems sensible for you given your own chapters of the day and definitely real live meditation is useful but only if you know what you're doing and why you're doing it and it's authentic otherwise just wait wait and study more Wait and have more mind training conversations with yourself. You know, don't feel like meditation is the only thing that's practice. Thank you. I especially appreciate generating the bodhicitta and giving it a little time before you even get out of bed. I, I do take three deep breaths and do that, but I think that I'm not giving it the time to really, like you, like you said, you know, at first you recognize it, but to really enrich your experience and then take you forward. So... That's all very, very helpful. Thank you. Really, a, a healthy, sustainable practice has consistent bookends. 
Yeah, the front end, you're really clarifying and deepening your motivation. At the end of the day, you're really checking in, how did I stay in alignment? How did I stray? And you just keep bookending the day and life keeps having meaning because you, you aren't disassociated from your own life. You know, so at the end of the day, if you want to do Vajrasattva purification with the four opponent powers, wonderful, please do. But if you want to just sit in your armchair and think about the day, do that. And just think very gently. There were times when I really kept patience in a way that I would not have done 10 years ago or 20 years ago. And that is practice and that is worth rejoicing in. And there were times today where I lost my, I lost myself, I lost my path and I snapped at someone or I was blunt or I didn't smile back or something that was not your path. And you know that, and you're not overly identified with it, but you're just sort of taking responsibility to say, that's really not a pattern I want to keep, you know, <laughs> I, it, you know, I don't want to be a grudge holder. I don't want to be stink face person. You know, I want to be friendly, <laughs> right? This is my path is to really deepen wisdom and compassion and have that in, as honest as it possibly can be, which means I have to check in with myself, you know? So you just, I don't know, cup of chamomile tea, cozy chair, cat, think, yeah. Regrets and rejoicings, regrets and rejoicings, neither of which you're overly identified with, but like make it a practice. And if that, then the thing is, is the hardest thing is getting the discipline. Once you get the discipline of doing morning and evening, you can gently weave more and more into it as your years of practice go by. You might start adding sadhanas or shamatha practice or vajrasattva or whatever. You can build it, but it's so hard to just get that consistency of come what may, morning something, evening something, you know? So make it gentle, make it ridiculously short, make it easy on yourself so that you'll do it, but, you know, get used to doing it. Yeah. And I think anytime you can have these Dharma conversations in your head in quiet moments that are less busy, it's like you're hitting refresh on your internet browser and it keeps things going a bit smoothly again. You know, refresh your bodhicitta whenever you can think of it, you know, just kind of keep it alive and functioning. Does that make sense? I would like to know if it's like a personal choice or it's better to do the, when you start your meditation daily, you refresh your vows. Because personally, I, I, took them but I don't do I don't think about them all the time like uh, as a ritual but, but I know I had them but verbally is it better to say it all every day I mean that little refuge prayer that that I you know just did at the beginning of class do it a lot it's a good thing to do do it in English do it in French do it in Tibetan whatever language you like but, yeah, it, but it, the it, vows, but the, the vows, vows not to kill, not to like I promise not to kill, not to lie, not to. It can be it can be really useful. It can be useful. Yeah. You don't you don't have to, but it, it can be very useful. Or one really useful thing to do, I think, with any set of vows that you have, you know. And I have three hundred and forty eight monastic vows and eighteen bodhisattva vows, and so, you know, like I got a lot of vows, right? So it's easy to get overwhelmed. And a really nice thing to do is to just pick one as your project mm. for oh. a while. Mm. And you're keeping all the rest as best as you can. You're not pretending you don't have the rest. But if you kind of prioritize your intention with one, you can really deepen it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in a few weeks or a few months, you prioritize a different one. So, so the most difficult for you personally, for myself, the one that I do like sometimes. Like, uh, sure, you could pick the tricky one. The tricky yeah. one. Yeah, you could pick the tricky one, uh, you know, or you could just cycle through them gently as part of your practice. Mm -hmm. Just cycle oh, through them. Yeah, thank you, know? you so much. Thank you. Thank you and, very much. Yeah, you're welcome. And, and that's the meditation we're going to do, right, is to just kind of look at our relationship with each of those, even if we don't have the vows themselves, to like look at your relationship with valuing life 
and with refraining from taking life. Let's just look at it, right? Let's look at our relationship to the belongings of other people and how much we might take them for granted or even take them. You know, let's just look at it. Just bear, you know, good self-honesty. No guilt, no shame, just honesty. Because if you know, you're going to be better at it. If you're in denial about your own habits, you'll never change them, will you? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Gently. Right. Yeah. So none of these self-knowings should hit you in such a way that you're like devastated and kind of fall into some sort of depression of how crappy you are or something. Actually, anytime you catch yourself in a way that's really not in sync with your path, in a way is a delight because you caught it. You're like, oh, that one, that is so hypocritical of me that I believe this, but I do that. That is embarrassing, but human. And I'm so glad I caught it. Not this like, oh my God, I'm a terrible person. I've been terrible the whole time. Oh, you know, none of that, right? Just like, oh, phew, I caught it. Like I got a little nugget. It's a juicy one. That little bugger has got some work to do. You know, like create some separateness. Remember that the stains of the mind are adventitious, right? Your Geshe's will always tell you this. They are extra, they're additional, they're not you, but you gotta catch them or else they're gonna just stay there, you know? So find like, oh, that's a juicy nugget, I'll get you. Yeah, <laughs> a little bit of separation. However, talking to yourself makes that happen. Okay, so we'll go ahead and dedicate and have our lunch break. John to Sam Chorim Poshem, Hake Pan Kiguachi, Kepan Yam Pame Pahi, Gone Gondu Kawasho. May the supreme jewel Bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more.